Hi, my name is Lonnie Ashworth. I'm Professor of Respiratory Care at Boise State University. I've been teaching mechanical ventilation of adults for more than 40 years. Recently, with the COVID-19 pandemic, it's brought up new challenges for ventilating patients. Now, I need to read a disclaimer first. All views expressed in this video are my own and do not represent the opinions of any entity whatsoever with which I have been, am now, or will be affiliated with. Always refer to your facility policies and procedures, as well as the manufacturer's recommendations for safe operation of these devices. So over the last week or two, I've been asked by multiple people if there's a way to ventilate more than one patient with one ventilator. All of us know that that is not optimal. We know that we should always use one ventilator for one patient. However, now we're in a situation where we're having to make decisions on which patient gets ventilated, which one is not ventilated and allowed to die. I am not advocating the use of this on patients normally. I think it's an option that we have at this time in a crisis where we have to find a way to ventilate these patients. In this video, we're going to use pressure control ventilation. We're going to use a Philips Respironics V60 in PCV. We're also going to use a PB980 in PCAC. I am convinced it can be done fairly safely if you understand the basic principles of pressure control. However, you cannot do this with volume control ventilation. In volume control ventilation, if there's a change in compliance or resistance in patient A, patient B will get more volume or less volume depending upon what happens with patient A. However, if you have a change in compliance or resistance in patient A, patient B is completely unaffected by patient A's compliance or resistance. Another fact is that we cannot allow patients to trigger breaths with this. Probably what we will have to do is ventilate patients that are heavily sedated or sedated and paralyzed, not allowing them to trigger additional breaths. Because we're using pressure control ventilation, we cannot guarantee tidal volume. We know that with pressure ventilation, we can monitor the driving pressure and we can help to regulate the driving pressure to an extent. However, we are not able to guarantee six mils per kilo or four mils per kilo. We'll have to use our clinical skills to evaluate each patient individually. We could set up this system to ventilate four individual test lungs, four individual patients, just by adding another set, and we'll show you that in a minute. Each of the two test lungs that we set up have a compliance of 0.04 liters per centimeter of water, and we've added two number 20 resistors. So the way we've configured the V60, we have a six inch section of aerosol tubing connected to the ventilator, going down to a tracheostomy T, then on either side of the tracheostomy T, we have a bacteria filter. Immediately after the bacteria filter, we have a one-way valve that allows gas flow to only go this direction, down to the test line. On the other side, we have another bac a bacteria filter, aerosol tubing connected to a one-way valve that is allowing gas to only go this way. It goes directly down to the patient and up to the test line. So right now, we're ventilating both test lungs. On each test lung, we have set a compliance of 0.04 and two number 20 resistors. With the test lung, because we're starting with PEEP of 10, and I'll come back to the ventilator settings shortly. 
our resting FRC is about 400 cc's and during inspiration it's going up to about 750 to 800 cc's so that's a difference of about 350 to 400 cc's each ventilator each test lung is set up similarly with the same compliance and the same resistance. Now, on the ventilator itself, when you initially set it up, it's important to, first of all, select ET tube. Once you've selected ET tube, next you have to make sure that you have the correct exhalation port, we're using a DEP. Once that's selected, then make sure that you have set your alarm setting appropriately for that patient. In this case, I've dialed the alarms out because we've been playing with the ventilator a lot, but make sure that these are set appropriate for your patient. We will always use PCV for this patient, for these patients. It's important that you only use PCV. <clears throat> Do not try to use ST. If you use ST and a patient triggers a breath, the, that inspiratory time will be dependent upon one of the patient's effort. So to help control the situation, you need to deliver breaths that are mandatory breaths using PCV. Also, you need to make sure that if you have auto track upgrade on your system, that you set auto track to normal. Do not turn it up to plus one, plus two, anything higher than normal that will increase the likelihood of the ventilator auto triggering. So make sure it's on normal. Now the settings that we've chosen to use, and I think these are reasonable settings to start with, is an IPAP of 20, which as we know is a PIP of about 20. We have an EPAP of 10, which gives us a PEEP of 10. I started with a rate of 20 breaths per minute, an inspiratory time of one second. We used a rise of two right now. However, you can titrate that for the individual patient. I would definitely turn ramp off and set the O2 at whatever is appropriate. Right now, I don't have the ventilator connected to 50 PSI O2, so I have to have it on 21%. When you look at your monitors, right now, we are ventilating the patient at a rate of 20. We have a tidal volume of 780 cc's, minute volume of 15.7, our PIP is 20. We have a percent leak of about 17%. And patient trigger, we had been triggering breaths earlier during the disconnection. Our TIT tote is 33%. The proximal pressure port line is connected from one of the circuits. The other circuit I have left off. It creates a small leak in the system, but as you know, the V60 does a very good job of compensating for the additional leak. I've tried it teeing those two pressure lines together. I've tried it separating and leaving only one connected and one open, and it made zero difference on the pressure and the volume. So right now, each of these breaths are timed breaths because our patient is not triggering any breaths. We have a set rate of 20 breaths per minute and our patient's being ventilated at 20 breaths per minute. We have a combined tidal volume of about 780, minute volume about 15.5. Our peak pressure is set at 20 and it's 20 centimeters of water. We have about a 20% leak and remember, I said that we disconnected the proximal line from one of the circuits and connected the other line. That's why we have a leak, which is fine. The ventilator handles a leak. We have a TIT tote of 33%.
because our TI is one second, our T-tote is three seconds. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to drop the compliance in one lung. And we'll show you that as we drop the compliance in, in, the, in patient A, patient B will be unaffected. Right now, patient B is getting ventilated with a tidal volume of about 350 to 400 cc's. Patient A is also being ventilated at about 350 to 400 cc's. I'm going to decrease the compliance. I dropped it down to about 0.015. Obviously, patient A, because we decreased the compliance, is getting a much lower tidal volume. In this case, the tidal volume is about 150 cc's. Patient B is ventilated at the same volume. And you'll see that our tidal volume has dropped by about the approximate volume that patient A's tidal volume dropped. Now, there's no way for us to tell what the tidal volume is in each lung. We have to use our clinical skills to be able to assess the patient. So one of the things that as clinicians we have to do is we need to monitor the patient continually and be able to watch how the patients are changing over time. If our tidal volumes, combined tidal volumes between the two or three or four patients had been 800 or 1200, and now it's dropped down suddenly, we know that there has been a decrease in compliance or an increase in resistance, and we have to evaluate the patients to try to determine what the problem is. So in this case, we're ventilating two patients with the V60. We can do that effectively. Each patient will be ventilated at that set pressure. However, we're not guaranteed that volume. That is typical of pressure targeted ventilation. We can guarantee the pressure, we cannot guarantee the volume. If we wanted to add more patients to this, we could put another T on here and connect two other circuits from there. We could put another T here and connect two more circuits and could conceivably ventilate two, three, four patients at one time. Now as a disclaimer, again, this is on test lungs. I have never done it on animals. I've never used this on human subjects, on patients either. However, I'm confident that this will work. As you work with this, if you see problems, if you try it and it works, please email me, let me know. All right, now we've connected two circuits to the PB980. We go through a bacteria filter as it comes out of the ventilator. We have a six inch tubing, of uh, aerosol tubing that is going down to a trach T. Then we have an inspiratory filter for each patient. This line goes down to the patient, comes back to the patient through a one way valve that only allows the gas to go to the exhalation valve through a filter. Then it goes up into the exhalation valve and out. The other circuit comes off of the first T. It goes through the filter, goes to the patient. Back from the patient through a one-way valve, allowing gas to go into the exhalation valve through a filter out to the atmosphere. Now we have also set it up to allow additional O2 coming in here if for some reason one you want a higher FiO2 for one patient than another you could connect an O2 flow meter and run additional flow going into this it would only increase the FiO2 on this patient 
it would not change the pressure for that patient because this is pressure targeted ventilation. So the ventilator would alter the flow rate to that patient in order to keep the pressure the same. But it would allow you to at least alter the FiO2 if you chose to. Now when you look at our ventilator settings, we are in PCAC. Again, I think PCAC is the only mode that you can use for this pa these patients. If we use volume AC, if the compliance goes down on one patient or the resistance goes up on one patient, the volume is going to go to another patient. If during PC, the compliance or resistance change on one patient, the volume will change on that patient but the other patients will be unaffected by that change. In this case, we have a rate of 20, a PI of 20, I mean a PI of 10, and a PEEP of 10, which means our PIP should be about 20. We have a TI of one. We set the flow sensitivity at 20. We don't want the patient triggering additional breaths. I don't have it connected to 50 PSI O2, so we had to leave it at 21%. We went with the manufacturer suggested 50% ramp or rise time. Make sure that your alarms are set appropriately. I have dialed them out in this case. Now when you look at your monitoring of the patient, in this case we have listed, or we have displayed PIP, tidal volume, PEEP, rate, and minute volume. Remember this tidal volume of 700 is a total combined tidal volume. We cannot predict exactly what the volume is in either patient. However, if there's a change in compliance in one patient, we can see the resultant change in volume, which that difference in what the volume had be, been is going to be caused by a patient's change in compliance or resistance. We have a compliance setup now of 0.04 liters per centimeter of water and a resistance of two number 20 parabolic resistors in each test mode. Currently, our tidal volume, the, on each test lung, the lung is starting at a volume of about 500 and it's going up to about 800, about 800, so it's about 300, 350 in this test lung and about the same in the other. So our combined tidal volume is, as it's displayed up here, about 700 cc's. Now, if there's a decrease in compliance in patient A, the pressure in both patients stays the same because it's pressure targeted. Patient A, because of a drop in compliance, is going to have a decrease in tidal volume. So the tidal volume in patient A went down, your total tidal volume went down. However, the tidal volume in patient B remains the same. In this system, the way it's set up, we are not able to identify individual volumes in each patient. Hopefully this video gave you some options and again, this is not optimal, but it is something that will allow us to ventilate two patients with one ventilator. If you have questions, send me an email. Again, lashwar at boisestate.edu. Thank you very much and good luck. Everybody be safe.